I'm going to speak uh, about COVAX, which colleagues and I at the University of Oslo have been trying to understand since it was first founded in uh, April of 2020. Um, and uh, I'll begin by briefly mentioning a couple of general features of financialization uh, in global health in general. And then I'll provide an example of how it played out practically in the creation of COVAX. Now, I'll argue that COVAX can largely be understood as an example of uh, what highly financialized global health looks like. So, I'll tr yeah, I'll, I'll try and tease out its exemplary features uh, um, when it comes to financialization of global health. And I'll end on some implications of uh, what the COVAX approach to pandemic response may mean for global health governance. Um, and so the term financialization, the way I, I use it and have used it with colleagues, uh, is that it usually refers to the fact that global health governance is becoming increasingly oriented towards financial concepts, motives, practices, and actors. Um, uh, but that doesn't really tell us what financial means, right? And so in my mind, what uh, uh, a good way to distinguish finance from other forms of economic activity, uh, which may be based, for example, on the production uh, or trade of physical commodities, uh, is that in finance, capital accumulation primarily happens by relying on existing money, on contracts and time. For me, those are the three key ingredients that make the cam uh, capital accumulation of uh, finance uh, possible. Um, and that uh, for global health, that means that banks and investors get more powerful, that the ways in which financial instruments and contracts are structured matters more than ever before. And we've seen how detailed uh, you need to get as an analyst to understand what is happening. So it's uh, that, that has big consequences for the research that we do. Um, and the financialization of global health also means that new sets of ideas start to dominate our thinking and our, our practice. Uh, and they include return on investment, investment risk, human capital, and so forth. And importantly, financialization changes the nature of operations of both the private and the public sector. So on the private side, uh, the work of Susan Sell, amongst others, has shown that um, financialization allows pharmaceutical companies and medical device manufacturers, for example, to get much bigger and much more powerful. Uh, it puts them into a better position to engage in lobbying and rent seeking better than before. And we've seen pharmaceutical companies heavily engaged in both of these activities during the COVID-19 outbreak such as when Johnson & Johnson, for example, threatened the Belgian government that it might rethink its billion dollar investments in the country if Belgium backed the TRIPS waiver, uh, or when Pfizer asked South Africa to put up sovereign assets as collateral for vaccine contracts, uh, or when Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, and Sinovac ensured net profits in 2021 of around 50 billion US dollars uh, at profit margins of between 62 and 76%. Uh, and another feature of a highly financialized private sector, I think, uh, is that it tends to get increasingly reliant on intellectual property, so as to keep most of the added value that's created uh, along global value chains with investors, rather than sharing it with blue collar labor around the world. And we can see this uh, during the pandemic insofar as profits and tax revenue associated with COVID-19 vaccines remained mostly located in the global north such as when BioNTech made a net profit of 10 billion euros in 2021 and paid 3.2 billion euros in taxes in Germany. Uh, but financialization also affects the public end of global health, health governance and the, the governments of high income countries are increasingly reliant upon and influenced by large corporate actors. Um, and this is a general trend in financialized economies that is then amplified uh, in epidemics and pandemics when these corporations also provide essential medicines and countermeasures of all sorts. So again, for example, uh, government reliance on corporate support was exemplified by Germany's opposition to the TRIPS waiver, which South Africa and India had first suggested in October in 2020, but then which was then only agreed after almost two years of stalling uh, in June. Yeah. So when the, when the TRIPS waiver was eventually agreed upon, uh, COVID had already killed several tens of millions of people, over 12 billion vaccine doses had already been administered, and global vaccine demand had plummeted. But the financialization of the public sector in global health doesn't just arise organically from changes in this broader political economy, uh, as the other speakers have pointed out, but it's also driven by a specific set of institutions including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Bank, the PPPs that you have mentioned, and I would add to uh, the global, uh, to the ones that have been mentioned, the Global Fund and CEPI, um, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innov uh, Innovations. 
um, and they um, blur the lines between financial investments and investments in health and between public health risk and corporate financial risk. Uh, so really uh, a fine grained and detailed discourse analysis, I think is one of the uh, tasks that uh, we have to engage in in a more financialized environment, more so than in other uh, uh, political and economic settings. Now, one way to understand financialization uh, uh, concretely is to look at COVAX. And as you all know, COVAX was created in early 2020 as a disease-specific public-private partnership meant to speed up the development of COVID-19 vaccines and to ensure their equitable distribution worldwide. So those were these two, two uh, objectives that it had was to speed things up and ensure uh, equitable distribution. And it was the vaccine arm of a broader technology-specific cooperation effort against COVID-19 called ACT-A. And COVAX aimed to deliver at least 2 billion vaccine doses uh, to countries around the world within the first two years of the pandemic to prevent global vaccine equity, but it ended up delivering less than half of this amount in the given time frame, uh, And thereby uh, it failed to prevent what the head of WHO, Dr. Tedros, ended up as describing as uh, global vaccine apartheid. And by that, he was just speaking about the fact that by September of 2021, so almost, again, two years into the pandemic, only 3% of the population of low-income countries had been vaccinated with at least one dose, uh, compared to the 60% in high-income countries at the time. And COVAX is often not considered a total failure because it did become the world's largest multilateral vaccine donations hub. Uh, and that's, I think that's a, that's a reasonable point. <laughs> Uh, and it consistently made the case for multilateralism in very nationalistic times. So, um, but what I wanted to foreground about COVAX here is that originally it constituted, I think, a largely financial solution to a global pandemic. Uh, and this shouldn't come as a surprise because COVAX was mostly run by Gavi and CEPI and created uh, under the guidance of the Gates Foundation and the World Bank. And so the first way in which COVAX uh, exemplified financialization is that it started out as a buyer's club, a, a vaccine buyers and distribution club, hoping to purchase vaccines uh, on behalf of all of its member states, and then and trying to uh, uh, distribute them across the world with the help of UNICEF and PAHO. And it aimed to first cover 3% of all the world, all the countries' populations uh, in the world, so all its member countries, but, but they were numerous and to protect, uh, uh, and thereafter, once uh, health and social care workers had been protected with vaccines, thereafter covering up to 20% of the populations uh, of all high-risk adults. Uh, and this idea of a buyers and distribution club uh, is, you know, that's, that's largely a financial mechanism, but it promised several advantages. Uh, uh, it promised to reduce global vaccine inequality and thereby uh, the spread and severity of COVID-19. Uh, it enabled individual countries to buy into a large pool of vaccine candidates and to reduce some of their risk of ending up without a viable vaccine. And the third advantage was that uh, it promised the um, increasing price control over vaccine companies by reducing competition between the countries that need to buy vaccines and by reducing information asymmetries between them as well. Uh, and in fact, early COVAX documents aimed, they, they were very explicit about, you know, price control, and they aimed at cost plus contracts with only a small profit margin for vaccines during the acute phase of the pandemic. So that meant that people purchasing the vaccines wanted to, much to, uh, wanted to know how much it costs to produce them and then, you know, agree on a margin that they would be happy to pay on top of that. Unfortunately, uh, COVAX's early uh, vigilance regarding vaccine prices was lost over time, uh, and Oxfam esti uh, estimated that vaccines could be made for as little as $1.20 uh, uh, in 20, uh, but COVAX uh, paid on average nearly five times more. Uh, uh, and more importantly, COVAX uh, didn't systematically uh, publish vaccine pricing data or any other contractual details. So the crucial advantages that a buyer's club uh, could have brought weren't realized. And this lack of focus on transparent and appropriate or fair pricing in a major pandemic was all the more surprising, given that the second major intervention of COVAX was to subsidize vaccine development. So COVAX documents consistently presented pharmaceutical companies as, as suffering from being too risk averse uh, to increase investments in essential pharmaceutical products. And so it argued that the pharmaceutical industry in times of crisis really needed push subsidies 
that is money to boost pharma R&D and manufacturing capacity. And so, for example, the Gates Foundation provided $150 million uh, uh, early in the pandemic to Gavi, which in turn passed these on to the Serum Institute of India to provide it with capital to help increase vaccine manufacturing capacity for AstraZeneca and Novavax uh, vaccines. And according to COVAX, uh, pharmaceutical companies also needed pull subsidies, such as volume guarantees, so you guarantee how much of a vaccine you're going to buy, as part of co committing to buying an overall quantity of vaccines, either from an individual manufacturer or from the market in general. Uh, and an overview of corporate subsidies uh, provided by COVAX has so far not been established. So COVAX does not disclose how much it provides in subsidies, uh, and neither does it report on whether and how it measures the effects of said subsidies or what it managed to negotiate in return, okay? And this is very surprising, I think, for three reasons. One is that this pandemic already saw a major rise in corporate subsidies when it was happening. And these included grants, uh, such as $5 billion from the American government to vaccine manufacturers, uh, or uh, close to half a billion from the German government to BioNTech. Uh, but vaccine manufacturers also received tens of billions of dollars in subsidies in the form of advanced purchasing agreements, or APAs. And the Dutch Center for Research on Multinational Corporations estimates these to lie somewhere between $45 billion to $90 billion. Uh, and again, it's hard to put an exact number on those because all COVID-19 related APAs remain undisclosed until today. And lastly, uh, all major pharmaceutical companies already began developing their own COVID vaccines and treatments very early in 2020, just when this crisis broke out. So the case that all of them urgently needed subsidies to even get going with their research uh, and their vaccine production, it really needs to be nuanced and needs to be investigated. And so when our research team put such you know, shortcomings to COVAX uh, policymakers, we were told that uh, at times that they may have been a little naive in negotiating with pharma companies during the pandemic and in focusing so much on subsidies and so little on uh, um, public bargaining power or pricing, for example. But I don't think naivety sufficiently explains what happened here. Uh, and when we look at the history of these subsidies, particularly of AMCs, we find that COVAX's focus on these subsidies with few strings attached echoes Gavi's policy and its long-term work on pneumococcal vaccine subsidies over the past 20 years. And in fact, these subsidies were first developed by a working group in the early 2000s that included members of the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, and the Washington-based think tank Center for Global Development in this report that I have here, uh, where they were developed as an alternative to temporary changes in intellectual property regimes in times of pandemics. Okay, so they have a long, a long history, and so, so this is not arbitrary. Uh, and recently, Gavi's outgoing CEO, Seth Berkeley, argued that future multilateral pandemic preparedness efforts will require, and I quote, publicly subsidized markets for pandemic vaccines. So Gavi still pushes for this uh, subsidies and no strings attached model. Now, a third way in which COVAX was a highly financialized solution uh, against the global pandemic is how it raises its own funds. And we've already heard about the IFM bonds that Sarah described that it used, um, but it also used private sector donations and was very vocal about those throughout the pandemic, you know, thanking the private sector donors, donors uh, for the money that they provided. Um, but both the bonds and the private sector donations, which are often also hailed as innovative financing, um, uh, must be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, so uh, on the one hand, they're hailed as being very important. So for example, mixing public and private financing or blended finance, was one crucial uh, ingredient that uh, ensured that the World Bank was going to be the host of the pandemic funds that has recently been established, because the World Bank has these trust funds called um, uh, financial intermediary funds or FIFs, and they managed to attract money from the public and the private sector. And that was one of the key assets for the pandemic fund to be hosted by the World Bank. So this is, this is seen as something really important. Uh, but Sarah already explained that IFM bonds are exceedingly expensive and likely provide no additional aid money. 
Uh, and the private sector donations, I think, are a wonderful thing. But if we look at how much the private sector provided to COVAX, it's, uh, you know, it's up to 5% and not more. Uh, so most of the money that COVAX used, 95%, uh, comes from the public sector. And so uh, in conclusion, um, I think that COVAX is largely the result of, of this kind of, of these longer term trends of global health financialization. And it, it tries to respond to a pandemic with these kind of micro microfinance mechanisms. Uh, so with a buyer's club, corporate subsidies, and with new and clever ways of raising private money. Uh, and importantly, in all of its efforts, uh, COVAX systematically favors private sector support without requiring even a minimal degree of contractual obligations or accountability or transparency in return. And so when it be clear that COVAX's financialized approach to global vaccine equity failed, and when calls for alternative measures became really loud in mid-2021, COVAX members insisted that they were the only solution for global vaccine equity, and that alternative solutions were misguided, or as some of them put it, stupid. Uh, and this insistence on being the one-stop shop for, vac for global vaccine equity, in spite of uh, evident failure, uh, was so strong that some activists and some global health scholars now are arguing that COVAX's main goal was to protect the private sector from higher taxes, cost disclosures, production quotas, target prices, or IP interference. Now, I personally do not go that far in my analysis, mostly because the formal and informal conversations that I have with people who were involved in COVAX don't support this interpretation of a hidden agenda. Yeah? Um, but what I think is true is that the kind of financialization that COVAX stands for is really heavily lopsided in favor of the private sector. And so one of the questions that I still have in this panel is whether we are concerned at all with financialization as such, or just with the rise of private finance more specifically. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.